Well, good morning. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, I'd like to turn to Psalms chapter 139 today. Psalms chapter 139, and we're going to be looking at verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. 13 through 16. Psalms 139 today. We continue on in our series entitled, Gut Check. And for some reason, when God gave me these messages, it just seemed like, um, you know, sometimes in life it's just time for a gut check. And we looked at this picture last week, but don't you just like that image of that little boy, you know, looking down at his belly, making, he's probably making sure his belly button's still there, right? Well, sometimes we just need to have a gut check in life. And, And what I mean by that is that sometimes we just need to turn and and look within ourselves and decide exactly uh, something that God is trying to speak to us on, an issue or or a problem or or just to to really focus on on something that God's put in our hearts. Well, today is uh, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And uh, we've celebrated this, we've remembered this, and we've talked about this for the last many, many years, and and, uh, today is no different. Today we think about life, human life, the sanctity of life. And as I was thinking about the sanctity of life, I would say, if I would present to each and every one of you in here today uh, and ask you, do you believe in the sanctity of human life? You would say yes. Amen? I think we're all on the same page of that. So the question today is not, do you believe in the sanctity of life? The question today would be, are you fighting for their lives? And that's what I was thinking about in this message. Are we really fighting for their lives? It's not enough just to talk about it. There's so many issues in our society that get talked about, that get discussed, that we debate, things like that. But what are we doing about that? Today, it's the forefront of our mind should be the sanctity of life. Uh, Cody's talked about it. We, it's been in the bulletin, and, and uh, the passage we're going to talk to you today speaks to that. But what is it going to take for us to realize that it's up to us as believers to fight for their lives. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's not something that we can put on the back burner. It's not something that someone else is going to take care of. You know, the the easiest way to dismiss something is, is for you to say, somebody else will take care of that. That's not my fight. That's not my issue. Well, when it comes to Christianity, and when we look at the Bible, God gives us every reason to stand up and say, we have to fight for life. Amen? That wasn't very convincing, guys. We have to fight for human life. Amen? We believe it's sacred and holy. The sanctity of life. It's not somebody else's issue. It's not somebody else's problem. It's not something we can be passive on. But we must turn and and search deep within whether or not we are really fighting for their lives. And so that's what I'm going to present to you today. In fact, here's the big idea of today is this, and this is, applies to each of our lives. God expects each of us to stand up and fight for the innocent and the unborn. Would you agree with me on that? God, God expects us to do that. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, an option. It's a requirement as believers that we stand up and fight for the innocent and the unborn. Why do we do that? Well, it's because God says so. How do we know that God says so? Because His Word tells us that. We can see all throughout the Bible uh, Bible, different, different areas that talk about life and how precious that is. In fact, from the beginning, as Cody read in Genesis, we see that God created life. And we're going to look at that just... Uh, briefly at how that is different and unique. The human life is different than any other life that God created. And and so I believe the Bible gives us plenty of areas and plenty of reason and plenty of proof and plenty of truth that we should be able to stand up and fight for life. In fact, in the Bible, in Psalms chapter 139, it's it's quoted. It's already in your bulletin. it's, It's mentioned. Cody mentioned that. But I want to read it to you. And the whole chapter, 139, is so strong about how God knows us and how we can't hide from God. Has anybody ever thought that you could hide from God? Does anybody feel like you can hide something from God? Probably right now, there's something that you're trying to hide from God and you just won't admit it. Something that you're trying to suppress, something that you're trying to just block out of your mind, an area that you don't allow God into your life, and, and, and you, you think that somehow God doesn't know. Well, if I believe in life and how God created life, God knows every area of your life and God knows every detail. 
And, and it talks about it in the book of Psalms. No matter where you go, you can go to the highest of highs or to the lowest of lows. You cannot hide from God. But then he breaks out in verse 13, and that's where we're going to dive into the chapter 139 today. And we're going to look at what he talks about life and the formation of life. So stand with me as we uh, begin. We read, started reading in verse 13. And here's what the psalmist says about God when it refers to life. He says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned before me, when as yet there were none of them. Let's pray. Father, we uh, come to you this morning at the reading of your word. Lord, we thank you that your word speaks so highly and so purely and so strongly, Lord, about the value of human life. Lord, I pray that we would truly, God, as believers, do our own gut checks today. We would search our own hearts and minds and realize there's enough proof just in your word today from these few passages, God, to make us fight even harder for those who are innocent and even unborn, God. Father, we pray that you would help us, God, to, to realize, God, that you expect us, Lord, to stand up. Lord, I pray today that we would be challenged to do so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning as we talk about this passage of Scripture, I want us to do our own gut check. Would you do that for me today? Would you, would you take the time in your life at this very moment to set everything else aside and really do a deep check of where you stand on this. Now, you've talked about this issue. You've thought about this issue. You may even prayed a little bit about this issue. You even heard on the news about all the things that are coming up to today about the pro-life day and things like that. But what have you done to stand up and fight for life? Well, I think the Scripture tells us very plainly the first thing that we can see from it today is this. God has created every single life. God has created every single life. Amen? Every single life. In fact, the creator of this universe, you think about God, and, and, and as we sang, it's the breath in our lungs. He formed us. He breathed life into us. In Genesis chapter 2, it talks about the life that He breathed into us. That is different than any other living being in this universe. You see, God created the animals, God created the birds, God created the fish, and it said He created them and in their kind and likeness. And so the picture that you get there is when God created them, it was special, but it was special in a way that He created them in a special manner of, 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 of volume. I don't believe that God took every fish that He put in the sea and He created them and put them in the sea one by one. I believe that God created fish and there they were. I believe God created birds and there they were. I believe that God created animals and there they were. He spoke it into existence. But whenever you look on in Genesis chapter 1 and also Genesis chapter 2, you see that when God created man, when God created us, He did something quite different. He took the dirt of the ground and formed us, it says, and breathed life into us and gave us life, and that life was very individual. He didn't just make a mass quantity of man. He made one man and one woman, and He continued to do so through the procreation of man. And so God had an individual hand in each and every life. In verse 13, it says, For you, talking about God, look at that with me here. For you formed my inward parts. He didn't say, For you formed all of our inward parts. He goes on to say, You covered me in my mother's wombs. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but that is a personal thing that he's talking about. It's not like a mass production of human life. It is that you personally, God, you alone, individually, formed my life. Now, if you're reading the King James, it reads something different. It says, you possessed my reins. And a lot of times when we look at verses, we have to say, well, what does it mean that God possessed my reins? Well, it means that you formed my kidneys. Whenever you look at the word reins in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word means kidneys. 
Now, that doesn't make much sense to us today. Does that make any sense to you? Shake your head no if it doesn't make any sense. No? Okay. Uh, some of you just don't even, you say, I don't know what he's talking about. You, you formed, I feel like I'm losing you guys. Come on, hang with me here. This is good stuff. Believe me, God gave it to me. So, so you, you possessed my reins. In other words, you formed my kidneys. Why in the world would the writer say that? Well, it's the same reason why whenever my little grandchildren talk about it, they say, I have Jesus in my heart. You see, when we think about our heart, does that mean, and I tell you what, when you talk to a five-year-old and a six-year-old, seven-year-old about Jesus, it gets pretty interesting, doesn't it? It could be because this conversation went on and Jacqueline turned to me and I'm like, Jacqueline, you're on your own on this one. Where did God come from? Well, God had to have a beginning somewhere. And, and, and their, their formation in their minds is that you have to accept that God has always existed. There was no beginning of God. He's always been. And to a five-year-old, that's hard to understand. And it's, it's even hard to understand to a 53-year-old too. That's why we have to have faith. We have faith that God has always existed. I have not always existed. God formed me in my mother's womb. He made my kidneys. When in reality, what he's saying is, God made us individually in a way that he formed even the inward parts of us in such a way that there's something inside of us that is different than any other person or any other creation. God has made us uniquely special, individual, within, without. God formed me where? In my mother's womb. You see, it doesn't only say that God formed us individually. Whenever they talked about about kidneys, they were actually talking about the inward parts of, of, of your body. And when we talk about the center core of our body, we talk about our hearts, right? Well, they referred to it as the kidneys. God made us individually, but God also made us intimately. He said, you covered me. Look at the last part of verse 13. He says, you covered me in my mother's womb. So, so individually you formed me, but you also covered me in my mother's womb. And that word covered means to weave together, to knit, to put together. And that's what he's talking about there. You put me together. In verse 15, he says that you, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought together. That, that skillfully wrought means to embroider. So all of a sudden you have these characteristics of God that God individually took us and handmade us exactly the way He wanted us to be. Do you feel special in any way? Do you feel humbled in any way? Do you feel like why in the world would the creator of the universe who could just speak me into existence without any strings attached would take and form me individually, personally, in my mother's womb? Do you believe that passage of Scripture? If you believe that passage of Scripture, then you have to believe that life begins at conception. That there is no way that you can say in the abortion issue and all the things that come up out of that is the fact that you're not looking at a life until you can see the life out of the womb. That is not when it begins. God began to form me individually exactly the way He wanted me to be inside and out in my mother's womb. And that's what it's saying. I've got an illustration for you, and I didn't want to pull it out till it's time. And I, I, if I was if I was prepared, I probably would have had uh, something else here. My wife said a chair will do. I've got something here to show you. I should have had a quilt rack to hang that on. What is that? That's a quilt, right? Hey, this is not a trick question. What is this, guys? It's a quilt, right? Okay, so you look at that, and you look at that quilt, and you say, somebody created that quilt. Now, of course, they took the raw materials that were already available, and they began to make that, but somebody had to individually make that quilt, right? It wasn't mass-produced. It was singularly made in a certain fashion for a certain reason, intimately put together. When did it begin? Well, let's say this. If you want to argue about life beginning at conception, did this quilt begin to exist before it was the finished product? You better believe it. The, the first time the creator of this quilt took this quilt and, and in their minds had fought. And, and if you study the Bible and you look at the other passages around that, do you know that you actually began before you were, began to be formed? Because in God's mind, He had already planned before the foundations of time that He was going to create you and me individually. 
Isn't it cool that the creator of the universe had you on his mind before you were ever created and ever came into existence? Isn't that neat? God Almighty and somebody in their minds thought, I'm going to make this quilt. And when they did, they personally, intimately, individually made this quilt block by lock, block, putting it together. I could not do this. My life depended on it, but somebody could. You see, God put us together exactly the way he wants us. That began whenever God began to knit us together in our mother's womb. Weaving everything together exactly the way He wanted us to be. So, God Himself took an intimate approach to your life. God has every single life in His hands put together in the same way. God has created every single life. Amen? The next thing that I want us to see, and, and I hope you can agree with, is this. Every single life has value and purpose. If God took the time to put each and every person together in their mother's womb exactly the way He wanted them to be, then every life, we would have to say, has value and purpose, right? You can never say, I have no purpose, I have no value. Whenever you look, and, and, and people like to pick on each other, and sometimes you think, well, I've never amounted to anything, uh, I've failed. Maybe, maybe, maybe some, some kids here in school, they think, well, somebody's picking on me, and yeah, maybe they're right, maybe I'm not worth anything. I can tell you, when you turn to the God, the creator of the universe, who created your life individually, uniquely, by His hands, you have great value. In fact, there's no higher value than anything in this world than your very life. You see, every single life has value and purpose. But I want you to hear something today, and I hope this kind of hits you a little bit. The way we, you, me, individually, the way we today, you and I, the way we stand and fight for that life depends on two things that I believe that I can point out to you today. First of all, it would have to do with value. We value everything. Everything has a value. When you look around, you value different things in your home and in your life and, and in your possession and, and in the world. Everything has value. So the way we value something has to do with how strong we stand up for something. Everybody here today would say, I place a high value on the sanctity of human life. We would say that. The value we place on it. How hard would you fight for this quilt? If you had to risk your life for this quilt, would you, would you die for this quilt? Would you stand up for this quilt? Would you give me $1,000 for this quilt? Now listen to me. Here's where it's going to get good. Do you know who made this quilt? My grandma. My grandma made me this quilt. And to you, it may just look like a plain block work, and there's nothing fancy about it, but my grandma had like a thousand grandkids, and she had a thousand quilts to make, so she couldn't take a lot of time. But she took time enough to do it. If somebody come up here right now and tried to take this quilt from me, I would bust you right in the nose. If you tried to trample this or destroy this or burn this, you would have a fight on your hands. I would fight you for that. Why? Because I know who created this. You get it? To you, it may not make any difference. To a lost world that knows no God, most of them don't value life because they don't understand its creator. But to me, I look at this quilt and I think there's a high value, not because the material is worth a fortune, not because it's the fanciest quilt that was ever made, because I know the hands that created this. And I would fight to death for this quilt. Because I love this quilt. You know, I think sometimes we put such a high value on other things in our life that we forget the value of every single life in this world. If you know God is your Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ, then why aren't we standing up and fight for the very lives that He creates? You see, it changes everything, doesn't it? It changes your thought process. To others, it doesn't matter, but to us, it should. Because we know the Creator. If you're saved by the blood of Jesus, say amen. amen. 
If you're saved by the blood of Jesus, that is God's handiwork. We see that. We know that. We must fight for that. The value of a life. Every single life has value. You may think you have no value in this world. I will guarantee you, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how handicapped you are, no matter how how much you have, no matter how little you have, no matter where you've gotten life or you don't think you've got life, you have great value and worth. You also have purpose. You know, I can think of many times in my life that I've went and visited with the elderly, most of them church members, And as I visit with them, sometimes they seem to think that, why in the world, have you ever heard an old elderly person say, well, I don't know why God's left me here. Have you heard that? They may be in a nursing home or they're in their home where they can't get out or can't do anything. And and, and by the way, sanctity of human life is not just about the abortion issue. It's about all life. I think sometimes we, 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 we look at that, and that's so important, and we're going to look at that here in a minute, how, the staggering uh, uh, facts about abortion, but, but the truth be known, there is value that seems to be lost in the elderly thinking they have no value in life. And, and you may be one of them here today, I don't know. You have great worth to the kingdom of God. Uh, I don't know how many elderly people I visit with, and you find out they are prayer warriors and when you talk to them or you have a crisis in your life, there's people in my, in my life that I have and I have had in the past that if i got something going on, I'm going to call them. They may not be able to set foot in the church. They may not be able to get out in society. They might not have jobs. They may not have much income. But the bottom line is this, their value is great for God's kingdom. One popped in my mind, Dorleen Hendrickson, our senior saint that we lost. I would go to the nursing home and I would visit with her and she would just, she wanted to go home so bad and thank God she's home now. But I would visit with her and she was like, I don't know why God keeps me here. I don't know why this, I can't do anything. There was a, she couldn't see very well. She couldn't get around very well. But I know that every time I went, she would encourage me and I would leave more encouraged by her than she did by me, I think. And I knew her love for this church and how much she prayed for this church. And I knew her love for me and how much she prayed for me. And I couldn't put a price tag on that. What about the value of someone caught in? And this is an issue. Folks, you think this is in a third world country? What about the the, the human sex trafficking? You don't think that's an issue? Then you got your head buried in the sand and you think you're living in Mayberry because it is going on in this country. There are young girls, even boys, that are being sold into slavery, into sex slavery, right now as we speak. They're trapped, they're caught. They're in a lifestyle that they don't know how to get out of. They're helpless, they're hopeless. Why don't we stand up for them? There's so many things that happen as believers that we let go by. Am I standing here telling you, well, I do all these things? I can tell you, I don't. I don't stand up for the helpless and the hopeless and the innocent like I should. But every single life has value and purpose. Your relationship with God that puts you together and put every life together intimately, personally, in the mother's womb, you should fight for. The next thing I want you to hear is this. If God has created every single life, and if every single life has value and purpose, then every life deserves a chance to live. Every single life deserves a chance to live. The first side of it that I think of is physically. Do you agree that every physical life, every human being has a right to live? Amen? To be born into this world. Their rights. The sanctity of human life. I want you to get your bulletin insert out right now because everybody has a bulletin insert if you have a bulletin. And on one side it says sanctity of human life. We're not just going to talk about it. We're going to look at this. We're going to graze over it. We're going to look at some facts. On the left-hand side on that column after the verses, and if you notice those verses are the verses I'm preaching today, right below Psalms 139 it says this, Life made in the image of God is the fundamental human right that begins at conception. Amen? 
According to our Declaration of Independence, folks, that is the United States Declaration of Independence. All men are endowed with their, by their Creator with a certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The order is significant. Life. Life is the first God-given right of every human being. If you do not have life, you certainly cannot enjoy liberty or the pursuit of happiness, right? Very simple. Unfortunately, our God-given right to life in America has been undermined in our culture of death. Now listen to this. This is what caught me. You want a statistic that really kind of just makes you say, wow, I didn't realize that. More innocent human beings are put to death every day, every day, every day than those who died in the 9-11 attacks. Doesn't that shock you? 9-11, the, the horrible tragedy that happened that day that many of you... How many remember 9-11? we got a generation that doesn't remember it. They're already too young to remember that. I remember that full well. Many of you remember that full well. 3,000 lives lost at the hands of the enemy. But 3,000 lives are lost every day to abortion. Abortion ends the life of 1.06 million unborn children in America every year. 21% of all pregnancies end in abortion. The overwhelming majority of those innocent children are simply sacrificed on the altar of convenience. Over 59 million, listen to this, 59 million unborn babies have been killed by abortion since the Supreme Court ruling on January 22nd, 1973. God help us all. Are you an American today? Are you a Christian today? Folks, that can't happen in America. 59 million abortions. What have I done about that? What have you done about that? What have we done about that? I was thinking about this patchwork quilt. It would be as if you would take and yank out about 21% of the 20% of the patches in this quilt. It would be incomplete. It wouldn't be what it should be. Because we are not standing for life. Out of that 21%, did you ever think about this? How many of you think our country needs revival? Our country needs a change? Our country needs to be living for the Lord? Our country needs better leadership, better government, better scientists, better people, better military, all those things? Well, guess what? Out of that 21%, they may have been our best that we've gotten rid of. Did you ever think about that? What would happen if you knew of one to be born that was going to grow up to be a scientist and have the cure for cancer? How hard would you fight for his or her life? What if it was one to be born and was going to be the next Billy Graham and we'd see hundreds of thousands of people saved by their ministry? How hard would you fight for them? What if it was one to stand up and, and, and speak out for rights and, and lead this country, the President of the United States, to lead us in a godly way like never before? What if it's just simply one that was to be born into society and to live and laugh and love and to pursue happiness in their life? And that happiness be found in God. You see, sometimes I think we don't realize the statistics should shame us. Everyone has a right to be physically born into this world, and everybody does not have the ability to fight for that right. But more importantly, I believe that everybody also needs the right and deserves the chance to live spiritually. You know, we talk about human rights and we talk about sanctity of human life. We talk about the unborn. We talk about sex trafficking. We talk about the elderly. We talk about euthanasia. We talk about all these things. But what about someone's right? How hard do we fight for the right? How much does people deserve to hear about Jesus? How many of you, by show of hand, believes that everybody in this world needs to hear about Jesus? Okay. 
how hard do we fight for that? What are we doing to make a difference in our society that not only stands up for the unborn and the innocent, but also the people who are lost and dying and going to hell that needs Jesus in their life? What are we doing about that? Does that break our hearts? Does that help us to understand that physically there's a battle going on, but folks, spiritually, there's a bigger battle going on and it affects the physical. Nicodemus, when he talked to Jesus, simply said, how in the world do I get to heaven? How do I understand all you're trying to teach us, Jesus? And Jesus said, you must be born again. Do you know for the unborn that doesn't get to be born? They go to heaven to be with Jesus. The one sitting here today that doesn't know Christ, we need to be fighting for your life. Without Christ in your life, you will not have eternal life. There is life to live here, but there's eternal life with God. Spiritually to be born again. I'm afraid that as Christians, we're not standing and fighting for either. Would you agree with me? We're not fighting hard enough for that. And I'd like to say this is a pep rally, but it doesn't seem to be. Because I fear that we hear the message. We hear God's Word. We sing a song of invitation, we go home. How in the world can you be more active in that? Well, I'm going to give you a way. And I'm not trying to shame you into it. I'm trying to convince you how important it is for us to be proactive in the stance for life. Tomorrow night, there's going to be a pro-life rally at the Christian church. At 6 o'clock p.m., we're calling for all Christians to gather together. Now, some of you may not be able to because of uh, maybe you, you work at that time or you have a commitment you can't get out of. But a lot of us are just, just saying, well, I just I don't know if I'm going to go or not. Some need to stand and say, you know what, I can at least go to that and learn more about it and become more active in my own community. At 6 o'clock tomorrow night, I want to challenge each and every one of you, unless something major is going on in your life, that you show up tomorrow night for that rally. That's the least we can do. And I'm supposed to get a head count for that anyway, and I'm not putting anybody on the spot. I'm just asking you. You may already have commitments. I don't know. How many of you would be willing to go tomorrow night? Now keep your hands up. I've got to count. About 20. I'm going to count on you being there. Maybe you didn't raise your hand up because you don't know whether you can be there or not. I want you to be there too. They are serving food. You know, you not only get a good presentation, you also get a meal with it. We're going to have a lasagna dinner to go along with it. Hey, if we can't get you just by guilt me into it, we'll guilt you into it. We'll, we'll win you into it with food. We need to support the pro-life movement. There's going to be a woman from the Crisis Pregnancy Center in Quincy going to come down tomorrow night and give a presentation while we're eating food about the issues that they face. It's going to be good. It's going to be a good time to fellowship together and join together. What else can we do? Well, we can stand as a church. How many of you are willing to stand up right now and say, I will fight harder than I have before for the sanctity of human life? I want to ask, and this oh, this turns into a tidal wave, but I want us to stand together. How many of you would stand right at this very moment, right where you sit, and say, Pastor, I know that I'm not fighting for life like I should. I let it go by. I've got my own little world, my own little problems, my own little things. And, and the bottom line is I never even think about the unborn or the helpless or the hopeless or the innocent or those who need a chance to live. Will you stand right now? What you're doing by standing right now is you're telling God, God, I'm not going to walk out of here and I'm not going to just let things slide by anymore. God, I'm going to 
see what I can do. I'm going to begin to, to educate myself. I'm going to begin to understand more about this. I'm going to be educated on the issue. Well, on the back of that pamphlet, it says pro-life action steps. Number one, look at number one, it's to pray. How many of you have prayed for the unborn? How many of you have prayed for the innocent, for those caught in sex trafficking? How many of you have prayed for those who are helpless? Would you do that? It says to affirm. Now, I know that we don't play politics here, but our president right now, I thank God, whatever side of the aisle you want to call it, our president seems to be standing up for pro-life. And we have a vice president that is a Christian standout believer. Thank God for that. So separate every issue out that you have with everybody else, and I thank God that we're seeing some pro-life movement happen right now. Pray for our leaders. How about we contact our representatives? I'm guilty of that. I, I, there's, there's a number right here. You can call and you can tell them, I stand for life and I don't agree with this. I agree with this and your neck is on the line. How about to educate? Tomorrow night you can become more educated about what it looks like to be a pro-life person. To support a pregnancy counseling center. I, I want to be honest with you right now, and I'm praying God gives me this opportunity again, and I, I haven't researched it. I don't know how. I was listening to the radio quite a while back, and it was an ad came on from a company who provides ultrasound machines to pro-life um, pro clinics. You know, there's plenty of clinics out there under the guidelines of what our government says is okay that will provide abo an abortion like that. But there are some pro-life centers out there. And those pro-life centers are begging for resources. They don't get government funding like the others do. And they say, if we can just have this machine, and I think it's an ultrasound type machine, if we can just take, and that mother that comes in and she thinks she wants an abortion, if we can take that machine and have that machine ready, we can show them that, that heartbeat and that baby. And about 80% of the women who hear that heartbeat, they change their mind. Honestly, they do. And at the end of that, they were pleading for money. I believe it's about $120 or $30 for you to give to help fund and come together and help fund for these clinics to have these. And I thought, that is exactly what I need to do. And guess what I did? Nothing. And I pray and ask God, God, give me that chance because you told me I should do that and I didn't. Folks, open our eyes. There's plenty of opportunities to help. I'm going to ask Cody that he comes and he's going to lead us in a song. We're going to pray to, before we sing. Just remain standing if you can. You know, you've said that you stand for life and you stand for, you'll fight for life and, and you'll fight just like if your grandma had a quilt, you know, that, that, that you would fight for that because I know who made that. God has made us intimately, personally, Everyone, and we need to be fighting for that. You may be fighting in your own minds right now. Thinking, you know what, if I go to that altar, somebody's going to think there's something wrong with me. There may be something there that you need to get rid of. There may be somebody here that's made that mistake in the past. And today God's saying, you know what, you need to give it to me and you need to lay it down. I can heal and forgive you. And God wants to do that today. Maybe there's somebody here today that says, you know what, I don't know what, why Don put this on my heart, but I know that I need to go forward today and I need to be praying for those unborn children that are being sacrificed on the altar of convenience. I need to be praying for those girls caught in sex trafficking. I need to be praying for the elderly that think they have no life or, or think that there's no reason for them to live. I need to pray for the sanctity of life in general. And when we sing, you want to come and just pray, God, help me. Maybe you're the one that you've got physical life now, but you don't have spiritual life you never given your life to Jesus, you could walk out these doors and without Christ, you know that you would die and go to hell without Christ. And you need to nail it down today. God wants to give you spiritual life today. 
Jesus is the answer. Father, I pray that you would just help us today to move in whatever way you call us to. We can pray in our seats. We can pray at this altar. God, help us to not just stand up in this sanctuary. Help us to stand out in our community, in our homes. Lord, help us to do all we can to fight for life. Lord, you have made life so precious and sacred. We need to be fighting for those who cannot fight for themselves. Burden our hearts. Help us to give it all to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.